My name is Moya Nyaundi. I work with Open Society Foundations and I'm the Advocacy Director for the U.S. Foreign Policy Team. My name is Yaki Silia. I'm the Chairman of the ISS Board of Trustees and the Head of the African Futures and Innovation Program at the Pretoria Office of the Institute for Security Studies. My name is Joseph Asonka. I'm the CEO of Afrobarometer. I came to USIP to attend the Africa's Future Summit, which is a useful summit talking about Africa and the future of African development. I guess the most important one at the moment is the rash of coups that we've seen, but it is really a function of a structural decline of Africa's growth prospects that started in the 2007-2008 financial crisis. The second one is probably what has happened with the Russian involvement in uh, uh, countering democracy and misinformation across Africa and the support that an organization like Wagner or the Africa Expeditionary Force, whatever it's called, is now providing to uh, some of the um, uh, coup forces. And I think the third is just the uh, slow growth transitions that we see that is having an impact on the continent, which means that uh, young people in particular are becoming more restless, growth is not translating into jobs, and there's a sense of frustration, uh, I think, long term, that we need to manage with a growing youth bulge. Poverty. I think they, on the continent, we have seen a day between 2012, 2015, there was the Africa rising narrative. And the Africa rising narrative did translate into some economic gains. So we saw a decline in poverty, and we could actually see that in our data sets, where we saw peoples who have gone without you know, food or other basic necessities really declined significantly. But since 2016, we have seen poverty continue to start to grow. And in the latest round of the survey in 2023, poverty is at the highest level since 2014. And so I do think that that constrains a lot and it creates opportunity for resentment. It creates um, friction on the continent as poverty grows and people will take advantage of an opportunity to you know, secure their daily bread. Just the rise in conflicts. Again, you see conflicts not just in Africa, but across the, the Russia-Ukraine war. We don't have to go into that. Then there's the Israel-Palestine. It's an ongoing war, but the, the upscaling of that conflict. And then uh, on the continent, uh, Ethiopia, Tigray, uh, Cameroon, uh, a forgotten conflict. You have Sudan as well. The list is endless. Globally, there are two issues I would mention here. One is climate change. We have seen increasingly, it used not to be a big issue on the continent, but now what we are seeing is on the data set, there's really a challenge. People are concerned about the effects of climate change and they're calling on their governments to take action. The second one being debt, which we have talked about quite extensively today, but the issue of debt and debt burden on the continent. You know, borrowing against the future is a very big risk for the continent. Clearly, we're seeing a rise in conflict, um, so uh, a rise in conflict. And if you have a rise in, in conflict, then you have um, in the situation in Sudan, you have a looming famine taking place. In Tigray, there was issues of loss of production that affects uh, food security. So it's, it's all tied together. Development, rapid growth the distribution of that growth, the creation of jobs. Um, that is our primary interest. So if you translate that into what needs to happen globally, it is stability. It's an end to uh, Chinese-US competition in Africa. It is collaboration and uh, stability that allows the opportunity for Africa to grow. ensuring that the quality of elections can be improved, that people can actually have a say in the, the governance, on, in who governs them. And that's what African citizens want. They're looking for the opportunity to choose their leaders through free, honest, and fair elections. And so creating an infrastructure or system that will allow people to have that power, to recall their governments whenever they want, they can do that. Probably the reform of the international financial institutions and providing space and opportunity uh, for Africa to grow. And the second is not to instrumentalize Africa, that uh, Africa is allowed the agency and is allowed to collaborate with whom it wants to, and not to bring other fights to the continent. The race against China, race against Russia, particularly as it relates to the continent, you're seeing a lot of 
former allies of democracy and governance on the continent, setting aside those values in their own personal interests, um, that is security interests and economic interests um, in, in that race and partnering with um, governments that are not necessarily uh, governments for the people. I don't think that realistically uh, states will do what is in their best interest. Well, I can argue that it's not in their best interest to partner with um, undemocratic go governance in the long term. However, um, they don't seem to be hearing that. So the alternative is partnering with the people, supporting um, democratic programs, supporting civil society, especially with increased uh, closing civic spaces.